friends, how are ya? Welcome back to my channel for a good old fashioned sit down video. It is a rainy stormy day today, so bear with me, but I feel like I'm so overdue for this video. I gave a little bit of my story about celiac disease and living gluten-free back in 2019 and is now 2023. So we are very overdue for just an updated version of this video. And in case you're new here, quick little introduction. Hello, my name is Mikkel. I am 25 years old, almost 26, and I was diagnosed with celiac disease when I was 16. So I'm right about at the 10 year mark of living gluten-free living with this disease, at least knowingly, <laughs> and managing it that way. So I wanted to just sit down and kind of explain my diagnosis, what that whole process looked like, and my symptoms, and how I manage it now, how I live gluten-free, answer some of y'all's questions about eating gluten-free. I will say, I am not a professional. I'm mostly going to be speaking from my own experiences. Um, being diagnosed with celiac disease did lead me to go ahead and study nutrition in college. So I do have my bachelor's in nutrition. That's about as much expertise as I have. And honestly, it's been a long time. Not really, but my brain has forgot a lot. So I'm not at all an expert, but I will be sharing what my experiences were. And hopefully that is helpful to some of you trying to figure out if you have this or just, you know, be there for friends and family who do. Without further ado, let me start with my diagnosis story. My whole life, I had just kind of gastrointestinal issues. For the most part in my childhood, I mostly just constantly had a pretty upset stomach and just digestive issues in general. And it wasn't until high school that things got significantly worse in terms of symptoms. And I noticed in the Q&A portion, a lot of people were like, was it a quick turning point or was it kind of a gradual build of symptoms? And I would say it was a gradual build because my whole life, like I said, I can remember having some sort Sort of issue but high school i don't know if it was stress related i don't know it just got way worse and in high school the symptoms i remember the most were i was incredibly fatigued i would run very random fevers all the time and pretty high fevers too like over 101 just randomly i was so bloated i was losing weight i couldn't really keep weight on but at the same time my stomach was just incredibly bloated. I honestly looked probably six months pregnant for most of high school. I lived in baby doll dresses because clothes were too restrictive and uncomfortable and I just I just needed to wear loose fitting things as much as possible. And at one point I started to have some internal bleeding. There was just blood in my stool. And so that's when people were like, so this is something more serious. This isn't just lactose intolerant, fructose intolerance, whatever. Continue to the process of going to a gastroenterologist and running tests and all those sorts of things. And as you might know, being diagnosed for celiac disease, often the first step is a blood test. And so that is what I did. But my issue was, I had already started to kind of suspect a correlation with gluten. So I had pretty much cut out gluten. And because of that, my blood test came back negative. So they were like, okay, maybe not celiac disease, but nothing else was making sense. And um, I was getting worse because though I had cut out gluten, I wasn't following like the strict celiac protocols. So I think I had cut out enough gluten for my blood test to show up as negative, but not enough to where my body could actually like heal itself. So I ended up doing the full colonoscopy and endoscopy to biopsy essentially the full digestive tract. Quite an experience. If you're over the age of what, what is the um, recommendation now, 45? 50. I'm sure you've had a colonoscopy, but if you're my age, 16 and in high school, <laughs> it is um, a new experience. I'll tell you that. I remember drinking the awful shake that was like liquid concrete. And then you're just like, you have to be very close to a toilet for a long time. And you go in and they put you under and essentially took a camera from top down and from down up and just took little biopsies along the way. And that is how I was actually diagnosed with celiac disease because what they found when they biopsied my small intestine is my villi were essentially completely gone. I feel like I should give you the medical definition of celiac disease and then explain how that kind of turned into what they saw in the biopsy. An immune reaction to eating gluten, which is a protein found in wheat, barley, rye, other grains as well, over time, the immune reaction to eating gluten creates inflammation that damages the small intestine's lining, which leads to other more serious medical complications. And it also prevents the absorption of some nutrients. And so what that looked like in me and in a lot of people with celiac disease is your small intestine has something called villa. I'm gonna use my fingers. They're like these tiny little hairs inside your small intestine. And to my understanding, to my knowledge, that does a few things. It helps to push food 
along, but also those are the little guys that absorb all the nutrients, vitamins, minerals, all those sorts of things. So when your body becomes inflamed over time, it wears those down to be little nubs and can wear them down to be essentially not even visible in a biopsy. And because of that, you start having deficiencies. You, you're not absorbing all of the vitamins, minerals, nutrients that you need. And I was starting to have more and more deficiencies of different vitamins that would show up in blood testing and people couldn't figure out why. So when we got that biopsy and saw that picture and saw the villi were almost completely gone, it kind of made sense of like, oh, this is pretty much how it looks in celiac disease that's been persistent for a long time and we need to completely cut out gluten, cold turkey, to give your body time to heal and eventually those little villi will start to build back up and you know be healthy and flourishing again so thus began my experience of eating gluten-free i was living in rural texas <laughs> which made eating gluten-free a little bit harder i when i was 18 moved to los angeles and eating gluten-free was a lot easier there's a lot more choices people are more educated restaurants have more dietary friendly options over the course of the next 10 years I was, and I am, incredibly strict, trying to avoid cross-contamination and everything of the sort in order to not get sick. And I would say that my symptoms slowly improved over time. It wasn't like I just flipped a switch and felt great. But something that I think was interesting, at least in my experience, whenever I would get, I, I call it glutened, and I feel like that's a common thing that people with celiac disease say, but whenever I would get glutened, at the beginning, it would be way worse than it is now. And my theory is as my gut has healed, it's just a little bit more resilient and like a little setback, a little bit of getting gluten would really take me down for the count for like a week. And nowadays it's, I, I feel it for a day or two, but it's not as bad as it was. The thing that has shocked me the most is now when I get glutened, it affects me way more mentally and emotionally than it used to. It used to be more of like a fever and kind of like physical symptoms I could present to someone and they could see on data like, oh yes, you are running a fever, you are sick. Now, I kind of feel like I spiral mentally when I get gluten. I, I would consider myself like a pretty joyful, happy person, but if I get glutened unknowingly, I wake up and I just feel like down in the dumps, like depressed, anxious, sad, and then over the course of the next day or two, my body will start to present a couple symptoms of just fatigue and bloating, and I'll be able to trace it back and be like, oh, Okay, I didn't first see the correlation of my emotions, but now that my physical symptoms are kind of coming out, I bet that the tortilla chips that I ate at dinner on Friday were actually not safe after all and kind of piece it together that way. I have friends with celiac disease whose symptoms are totally different. Some people are completely asymptomatic, don't see any symptoms at all. I have one girl that I became friends with in college who her only symptom was incredibly stunted growth. She was not diagnosed until high school as well. And she was, I, I don't wanna get it wrong, but I think she was like four foot nine at age 16 as well, got diagnosed, cut out gluten, and within the year was my height. I'm five foot seven. That was literally her only symptom. She felt completely fine otherwise. So that's what makes it hard to diagnose as well, is it's like the symptoms can present itself so differently because it really is just inflammation in your body and in your gut, which can lead to different things for every person. Another part of my diagnosis story is at age 22, I was diagnosed with lupus. And as you might know, autoimmune diseases can sometimes go hand in hand. If you have one, you're just more likely to develop another. And I didn't really have symptoms present, I don't think, of lupus until probably age 21. And so it's kind of hard and muddled to look back and see when I was feeling bad, was it because of celiac? Was I gluten? Did I eat something? Was it because of lupus? It's just kind of sort of messy. And I feel like autoimmune diseases are still just kind of being discovered, kind of being figured out. There's a lot of research that needs to happen. For example, I don't know what the updated statistics are on this now, but when I was going through my celiac disease diagnosis, a gastroenterologist was telling me that it's interesting and it's confusing that there is a genetic aspect to celiac disease. You have to be genetically predisposed and about 30% of our population has that gene, but celiac disease only presents itself in less than 1% of the population. So they're like, what does it take to basically trigger the onset of this disease presenting itself once you are genetically predisposed? 
they don't exactly know. One doctor told me perhaps a theory they have as to why I developed it, where like my sister hasn't, was an overuse of antibiotics as a kid. I had a lot of staph infections in MRSA. I was just on a lot of antibiotics all the time. And they said that they've seen some correlation with that kind of triggering the spur of celiac disease when it's in your genes. Basically the TLDR is, it's still kind of a mystery. There's still a lot of research that has to be done. I wanna jump into the part of this video where I answer some specific questions. I asked over on my Instagram, which if you wanna give me a follow, I share a lot of gluten-free things and also just life. I don't know, I share a lot of random stuff. Follow me at your own discretion. But I asked over there if there's any specific questions or things you wanted me to touch on in this video and I screenshotted just random things in no particular order. I do wanna say though, it's on my list to make a video about all the sneaky ways gluten hides. Whether it's reading a label and keeping your eye out for things like modified food starch and caramel coloring and things like that. Or if it's being in a restaurant and knowing what questions to ask, like are these tortilla chips fried here? Are they in a shared fryer? Or do you bring in bagged tortilla chips so that's coming as a whole separate video because I could talk about that forever. Like I said, no particular order. Let's get into the questions. Okay, how to handle when friends want to go somewhere that has no gluten-free options. This is a struggle that I know very well. And I think you just have to be honest with people. Be like, hey, would love to come hang out. And it is hard that our society, a lot of it is um, centered around food. Like a lot of community is centered around food. So what I do is I tell people like, hey, um, I looked into that spot. I don't think there's anything I can eat there, but I'm gonna eat it before and I would love to come hang and get a drink. Sometimes they'll be like, oh, let's go somewhere else. No big deal. We can, what's, what's a spot that you can eat? Or, you know, if it's a big group thing and it's someone's birthday and they really wanna go there, it's great, awesome. It's just awesome that you're coming to hang. Do you feel safe with cross-contamination with eating out? Frankly, eating out is always a risk. Eating out is also my favorite hobby. I'm just such a foodie. There's nothing I love more than going out to try new places. And I've just kind of learned the, the dishes that feel riskier than others, if that makes sense. Um, and we'll avoid those and just ask a lot of questions. And I fully gauge my confidence off the confidence of my server. So if they seem even a little bit hesitant or like they might be kind of making something up, I just won't order that dish. I'll do something that feels a lot safer, but there's always a risk of cross-contamination. And if you don't know what that means, it's essentially eating things, consuming things that were prepared in a shared surface, shared fryer, shared whatever that had gluten so that gluten can cross contaminate your food. So yes, there's always a risk. I don't always feel safe, but if I feel like someone is just uneducated on the preparation of a dish, I won't risk it. You know, if they come to me with the ideas of how to make it safer, I will feel a lot more confident eating it. How do you deal with guilt when having to order food? Why do I feel guilty? I totally get that. I hate feeling like an inconvenience, but I feel like if you tell people, and it's all about tone too. If you tell your server like, hey, I have celiac disease, so I just have to be really careful about the ingredients. I know that's inconvenient. If there's something really simple that you recommend me ordering that just feels safe, let me know what that is. A lot of times I don't choose what I eat at restaurants. I'm just like, you tell me <laughs> what is safe and easy on your end so that I'm not stressed, you're not stressed, we can all have a lovely time. But I really think it all comes down to tone and it's not your fault that you're gluten-free um, or that you have celiac disease. Since gluten-free is trendy these days, do you ever feel like your allergy isn't taken seriously? Yes, it is such a double-edged sword. I don't even know if that's an accurate way to describe it. There are so many pros and cons to gluten-free eating being trendy nowadays or common or something that people just try just because if they don't have celiac disease or an allergy. The pros are there's an increased demand for gluten-free products. So companies will start putting more products on the shelves in grocery stores. Restaurants will feel the pressure to label gluten-free on their menu because they know that more people will want to eat there. The con, if you're going out to a restaurant, there's a good chance you're the seventh person that night that your server has had that has said that you are gluten-free. And when they have that many people saying that they are gluten-free, Free, they're not gonna take the same level of precaution of like asking the kitchen to change their clothes, to use new utensils, to use a fresh knife to cut your whatever, all those sorts of things because there's just too many people that were gluten-free that night. They can't do that every single time. So what I would ask for as a celiac person is if you are a gluten-free person and it's not celiac or it's not allergy to tell your server this is preference. Like 
Don't stress, this is just preference, but if you are someone with celiac disease or an allergy, specify like, I have celiac disease. I have an actual allergy, this is serious. Just keeping in mind the toll it takes on the restaurant and the restaurant staff, and if you don't need that actual sort of special attention, to save that effort for the people who do. Benefits of getting tested for celiac versus not, if you know that you're affected by gluten, I would say there's a benefit because it will give you the knowledge of the level of seriousness that needs to be taken. Um, like if you're gluten sensitive, you might not have to worry as much about cross-contamination and things like that. But if you're celiac, you know that you actually have to put forth the mental toll, <laughs> the effort to make sure every single little piece of it is okay. When you're traveling, do you use a certain website to verify celiac safe? There's Find Me Gluten Free, which is sometimes helpful, sometimes not. It's essentially a website that people say, I ate here, um, the servers were super helpful and attentive, I didn't get sick, or I ate here, they label gluten free, but I still got sick. So sometimes I'll check things like that, but my biggest hack nowadays is I actually go to Yelp. I click photos of the menu because I have learned that oftentimes they'll denote more allergen type things, like if something can be made gluten-free on a physical printed menu instead of on the PDF on their website. A lot of times if I'm going with a group or with friends, I'll call and I'll ask all of my questions ahead of time and make a game plan for what I'm ordering before I'm there so that I don't have like the societal kind of pressure obligation of like asking a million questions while everyone's just sitting staring at me. So I'll call and I'll be like, hey, can you tell me which dishes are safely gluten-free, any mods I need to make? And then when I'm there, I'll tell the server, hey, I called earlier and found out that if I take off this, it's safely gluten-free. So can I do that? And just kind of like reconfirm without asking all of the questions. Best substitutes for common gluten options. Um, if you're talking about baking at home, my favorite flour is Bob's Red Mill one-to-one -one ratio baking flour. It's just, it's not the healthiest flour, but it just is the most similar, in my opinion, to regular wheat flour. Um, so you won't have to make a ton of modifications in baking or add your own xanthan gum or whatever. So that's really nice. And then in terms of just regular, you know, breads and stuff, one of my favorite brands is Char's. It's not at all healthy, but it does just taste the most simple. It's incredibly accessible. Like even Walmart has it. A lot of times you can leave it out um, in the pantry instead of having to refrigerate or freeze like a lot of other brands. So I go to that a lot if I am having people over and don't want them to like super notice something is gluten-free, that's a helpful brand. How do you handle dating when celiac? For example, do you have your boyfriend brush his teeth before kissing you? I do. <laughs> He's super kind and chill and understanding. And so he'll actually always be like, wait, let me think through what I've eaten today. Okay, I did have a sandwich at lunch. I'm gonna go brush my teeth before coming over or whatever. Um, so it's incredibly helpful to have an understanding and kind partner, but I won't kiss him if he's eating gluten just because that is literally cross-contamination. Advice on accommodating a friend who's gluten-free. That is so kind. If you're asking about eating out, I would ask them, hey, what are places that you feel safe eating? We'll go to one of those, like throw out a few options and we can all choose one. Um, if you're having them over, I will say something that stresses me out the most is going over to someone's house to eat because I just can't know for sure if they know all of the little secret rules of um, how to prepare food safely. I think something that's helpful is either like, hey, do you want to cook together? Do you want to bring something? Is there a spot you want to order in from? Is there like a frozen pizza or something that you feel safe with that we can just pop in the oven? Um, but having them kind of be a part of it as opposed to like, I made you this gluten-free mac and cheese. I promise it's probably gluten-free, <laughs> which is so kind. It's just a little anxiety provoking because it requires complete absolute trust. But if you do really want to cook for them, the simpler, the better. Like if I can tell that this is just baked asparagus, with salt and pepper, I will feel a lot safer than if it's something like, um, you know, a soup that has 25 ingredients in it and it's hard to tell exactly what it is. Those are my tips. What do you do when you go to other countries? Can you eat gluten there? I screenshotted this because this is one of the biggest myths. As someone with celiac disease and a nutrition degree, that makes me, I don't know why this makes me so mad. Genuinely, 
I get frustrated when people are like, oh, you have celiac disease? Did you know you can eat the pasta in Italy? I'm like, no! <laughs> gluten is gluten is gluten. Gluten is a protein that is found in grains, like wheat, barley, rye, other grains as well, like couscous, or there's a lot. But uh, those grains in Italy are not completely without the protein gluten. What's different is perhaps maybe there's fewer pesticides, maybe there's fewer genetic modifications, maybe it's just, I know clean is a controversial word, but maybe it's just like a cleaner option, but it is still fully glutinous. So if you're someone who's sensitive to pesticides and um, the genetic modification of grains here in the United States, like perhaps you will feel better eating this more homemade, homegrown, home milled style flour. But if you have celiac disease, gluten is gluten. What do you wish was more common knowledge about celiac and gluten-free eating? One thing that I've noticed is a lot of people think gluten-free means low carb, which is not true at all. Rice is gluten-free, potato is gluten-free, corn is gluten-free. These are all very high carb things. And I think that sometimes servers will confuse that, especially in like smaller towns. That's a common thing in my hometown. Another thing is just soy sauce. Soy sauce is not gluten-free and that is hidden in a lot of things. And then people will start to confuse soy and gluten. So I just wish that there was a little more education about that out there. Like you can have tamari, which is soy, but is gluten-free soy sauce essentially and have something be gluten-free. And soy sauce is the thing that trips up people a lot in restaurants when I'm ordering. So I wish that was more common knowledge as well. Strange question, but oat milk isn't gluten-free here in Australia. Is it gluten-free in the US? Yes, well, okay. Brands like Oatly, I have heard are not gluten-free in other countries, but it is gluten-free here in the United States. Every brand is different, just always make sure. But I feel like most brands in the US have decided why not just make this gluten-free, which is awesome, but I always read labels. But I do get comments all the time from international friends when they see me use this, because I use this in my lattes, in my cereal, everything. But in the United States, certified gluten-free. I always look out for this guy if I can. Very helpful, but just there's proof. In the US, Oatly at least, which is like the number one brand of oat milk, is gluten-free. One final question to end off this video for now. It's kind of a fun one. If you were to remarry, would your husband or even future children need to be gluten-free too? They would not need to be. I have lived with a spouse who wasn't gluten-free before and it just, it's easier if they are. It's less stressful, it takes a lot less planning, but it's totally doable. You just have to be mindful of really washing things or having your own versions of things. So like for my little oven, I would have two pans and I'd be like, the silver one is mine for gluten-free, the black one is yours for gluten. And I put everything in the dishwasher. Here comes the sun. Do 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 do. If you're living with someone who eats gluten, there's ways to make it work, totally. They don't have to change their diet too. Always easier if you know your whole house is gluten-free. That would kind of be nice. <laughs> okay, those are the questions that I screenshotted and just kind of my experience in general. Let me know if I should make more specific videos about celiac disease or living gluten-free. I will be doing that video very soon about all the sneaky ways that gluten hides, so keep your eye out for that. I love you. If you're on this journey, I pray it goes well for you. Nothing like a good gastroenterologist. Best of luck. But it's getting easier out there. Lots more options. So we got this. We're all in it together. I love you. I hope you have the best rest of your day. And I'll see you in a video very soon. Bye. So give me a sign. Give me a sign. Oh, give me a sign. Baby, give me a sign. Just give me one more. Talking to you, here we go again. Staying up all night to see if you've been texting me. Where do we go from here?